Welcome to Strictly Money at the News Farm, where all voices matter. I'm Sajal Patel. Many retirees are discovering that they haven't saved enough, that they are likely to live longer than they initially thought, and that the cost of living is well beyond what they believed they'd face. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that more and more senior homeowners are getting reverse mortgages. Watch any commercial and they'll sell you on the upside that you don't have to make any payments and you can stay in your home for as long as you like. But like any sales pitch, they don't tell you about the downside and there are risks you need to be aware of. To discuss what those are is Shakruk Temarov. He is Vice President, North American Financial Institutions at DBRS Morningstar. Shakruk, great to have you on. Good morning. Thank you for having me today. So, Shakruk, um, Home Equity uh, is one of the, the one of the providers of reverse mortgages, and they've said that they've surpassed one billion in, in loan uh, originations two years in a row. Um, so, we're certainly seeing demand up. Is it is it driven because of an affordability issue? So, people are pulling money out to to sustain their everyday living, or do you think this is more of a lifestyle issue um, problem that you know uh, seniors want to stay in their home? Right. The reverse mortgage in Canada gained popularity in recent years for different reasons. So seniors tapping the uh, um, utilizing reverse mortgages um, to cover, for example, living expenses, to make the renovation of their properties, to pay that credit cards, as well as, well as to make uh, to provide early inheritance to their children. So among those factors, actually more common reason why they are actually utilizing reverse mortgages is associated with a desire to provide early inheritance to their children. So mm -hmm. it's more about actually the, their children financial needs rather than their own financial needs. As you know, owning the property in Canada becoming less and less affordable in recent years, particularly yeah. in GTA and GVA. So by utilizing this product, seniors providing early inheritance to their children so that they can actually make down payments for their own home purchase. That's more common reason actually we're observing in the market. That's really interesting. So let, maybe just let's step back and can you just explain how reverse mortgages work? Right, so reverse mortgages is specific product tailored for seniors aged 55 and above. And essentially, it's a product secured against the uh, borrower's primary residential property. So you have to live in the property at least six months in a calendar year in order your property uh, remains eligible for the reverse mortgage. So reverse mortgage is not amortizing debt, rather it's approved for life, and, and uh, uh, principal is uh, repaid at when, whenever loan becomes due. And also, you're not required to make the periodic interest payments. So interest payments also accrue over the tenant of debt, which means that when loan is due, the, the loan balance could have grown a lot compared to initial value at origination. Yeah, and that's the part that I wanted to talk about because I'm, I, you know, I, I just want to make sure viewers do understand um, the risk. So, how big of a risk is it for homeowners? Say they take out two hundred thousand dollars, right, and they don't pay it back for ten or twenty years, and that interest accumulates, and we know that interest is somewhere around seven or eight percent. So, it, you know, it, it could be a lot, lot to owe. It, exactly, you're right in that sense. So if you take your example, for example, even though the uh, uh, reverse mortgage is approved for life, it could become uh, due any time, depending on the trigger events. Mm -hmm. For example, it could become due in one year or 20 years. So let's say during the 10 of 20 years, you're not making any payments uh, on principles or interest rate, which means that in year 20, your loan balance might have grown a lot. But the risk actually is more on the uh, lender side rather than borrower side. So mm. if you take the extreme case whereby, let's say, the loan value exceeds the property value, fair value, uh, when the loan becomes due, in that case, the shortfall actually is a loss for the bank. So the bank wouldn't have recourse to borrower or his or her other assets 
in such case, as long as borrower is not in technical default. Okay, so that's really interesting. So the lender actually is the one that takes the, the greater risk uh, in, in most cases. We're going to take a quick break, Shock Group. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Um, Shakru, before the break, we've been talking about risks when it comes to reverse mortgages. Uh, the risk for the borrower or the homeowner would be, I guess, that they default, right? Um, what could trigger that? Let's go through that. Right. So default scenario for reverse mortgages is different from conventional mortgages because as a borrower, you're not required to make periodic payments. So the default scenario includes the, the circumstances, for example, when the borrower um, is, cannot stay current on property taxes or cannot pay in time uh, home insurance or they can't maintain the property in good shape. So these are the common default trigger scenarios, even though the, uh, there could be other specific uh, scenarios um, dictated by the lender. But they are the common scenarios. If you take, for example, property tax, if you can't uh, pay, if you can't stay current on your property tax, municipality government would take over the ownership of your property and perform a tax sale of your property. So technically, in that case, you would seize ownership of the property, which is one of the trigger that uh, for the loan to become uh, uh, payable or to, uh, to be repaid. Okay. Um, I know you can stay in your home as long as you like. You know, this is one of the selling points when it comes to reverse mortgages. And I guess you're lucky if you can. Um, you know, but if you do, suppose you go into a long-term care home, what happens? Or even if one of you and the other spouse doesn't go, what happens? Right. So there are different... Um, trigger, ev trigger events we call uh, for the loan to become payable or to be repaid. And actually moving to long-term healthcare facilities with those triggers. So what happens is that if you decide, if the borrower decides to move to long-term uh, healthcare facility, uh, he or she has to actually repay that within certain period after moving to healthcare facility. Okay. Um, can you borrow? I, it says that you can borrow up to 55% of the, of the uh, current value of your home. I suppose that actually does depend on a lot of things, right? Um, can most seniors access that amount or, you know, what's the, what's the average amount? Right. So I think it's very case specific. Um, and uh, actually, every lender had their own criteria in terms of uh, uh, how they underwrite and which factors they look at, take into consideration before approving the loan. But one of these uh, things um, uh, relates to actual discount factors. So depending on where the property is located and type of dwelling, whether it's a condo or a single family or detached family, how there could be different discount factors applied to fair value of the property before the approval. And in certain cases, for example, if the property is located in some of the remote areas of Canada, uh, with a fair value being less than certain amount, your property might not be even eligible for this loan. So that's why the, uh, the uh, borrowers should work with lenders uh, to uh, discuss the specific nuances and circumstances. Oh, that's really interesting. So. Um, it really does depend on location. Is that because of maybe the marketability of the property in, in the future? Indeed. So like in Canada, uh, GTA and GVA areas considered more liquid, deep market. And uh, so marketability is not really an issue. But if you go beyond those areas to more remote areas in Canada, liquidity and marketability becomes an issue. And to account for that and to mitigate such potential risks, Lenders actually apply different discount factors. Okay. Now, um, EQ, I think EQ Bank is one that also offers it. There's only two providers. Are they are they different? Do they are they offer the same type of product? Right. So there are mainly two providers in Canada. 
uh, for US mortgages. One, one, the largest one is actually Home Equity Bank, and the second lender uh, in terms of size is EQ Bank. So the market, uh, the competition is not high uh, at this moment in Canada, but EQ Bank is also looking to expand the portfolio. So we're expecting sort of competition as well to increase in coming years. So in terms of products, they're very similar and, and I would expect the underwriting standards and criteria as well to be very similar because both banks are regulated by OSFI. Okay. Shakur, we really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for coming on and your insights. Thank you for having me today. Shakur Chavarov, DBRS Morningstar. Stay with us because when we come back, we're going to be talking about the housing market and whether you should go fixed or variable when it comes to your mortgage. Welcome back to Strictly Money. The Bank of Canada has raised the benchmark interest rate once again. The hike is the eighth one in a row and it brings the rate to 4.5%. Now, this comes at a time when homeowners are already struggling with the highest borrowing rates in almost 20 years and where prospective owners could soon face even tougher mortgage rules. Joining me now with his thoughts on what this could mean for the housing market is mortgage broker Ron Butler. Ron, great to have you on. Hey, thank you for having me. Great to be here. So heights like this, uh, it makes a lot of mortgage holders nervous. Uh, how are you reading the housing market right now? Are, are you starting to see cracks in terms of people defaulting or, or is there still a lot of resilience? Well, default rates are at historic lows, but there's certain areas in the housing marketplace that are feeling it more than others. If we think about it, they're, they might be obvious, but they're, they're, if you're not involved in it, it's hard to say. For instance, we have People who bought pre-construction homes, some of these are houses and semis and townhouses that might have been bought two years ago, 18 months ago, and will be coming on stream for people to take occupancy in the next six months. Now, some of those purchases were at probably apex pricing in Ontario and British Columbia. Uh, they were at the highest point in the price cycle. And coming into the next six months, some of these houses are simply not going to be worth as much as the people paid for them. Um, and that could be a serious problem when appraisals come through for less than the purchase price and people are going to have to find more down payment. Now, that isn't everybody. Some people find it easy to accomplish, but it's definitely going to be an interesting six months. Yeah, definitely. And I was I was actually wondering, because you hear um, some reports of of you know, condo builders saying, well, we need more money. So you got to pony up. Are you seeing that? Well, that's rare. That is okay. fairly rare. Uh, what we are seeing in the condo space is uh, another phenomenon, which is those who bought multiple units, say four years ago, five years ago, these people actually never intended to actually close on the condo and own it. They intended to flip those condos by assignment to others who would finally close and, and either use them as investment properties or live in them themselves. Now what's happened is there's a lot more concern about those the easy returns there. Like, will everybody be willing to pay 100 grand more than what the original people paid? Maybe they're going to have a hard time selling them by assignment. Now, the key thing is for those who bought two or three or four at a time, who never expected to close, if they do have to actually close and come up with all the money to purchase these condos, they may not be eligible for mortgages because they never expected to have to do it. So that's a, another layer of concern that's going to evolve this year. You know, Ron, I, I see a lot of headlines like, um, you know, prices are down double digits. But from what I can see, they're, they're still well above pre-COVID levels. Uh, even with mortgage rates at these levels, are you expecting prices to fall further? And, um, uh, you know, I'm just wondering what happens in, in the spring when the activity is kind of in full force. Well, actually, there's been a flurry of activity in the last three weeks, essentially from, uh, you know, the day after the New Year's break. There's been accelerated interest in pre-approvals. There's been more purchases than probably the whole month of December. Uh, you know, it, it, there's definitely a bit of activity. 
Uh, this may be a reflection of a number of different forces, people. There has been some reduction in fixed rate mortgages. They're down from in the fives down to in the fours. And this may have encouraged some people to go out and buy. Let's face it. There's always people looking to buy a home. There's first-time buyers who felt frustrated for the last year. They were uncertain. There is pent-up demand. Uh, it does happen. Uh, I think there's still an opportunity for prices to drop in some of the most expensive regions. Again, uh, Ontario and the lower mainland of British Columbia. Still those chances that prices will grind down, uh, but there is a little flurry right now. Okay. We only have about 45 seconds um, to the break. So do you think that there is a floor to, to housing prices, um, especially because, you know, we still have record immigration coming in and like you said, still pent up demand and not enough supply? Yeah, there's always a floor in Canada uh, on home prices. Trouble is we don't really know where the floor is. Like the floor could come down quite a bit further uh, before it actually does turn into a concerted upswing in prices. Uh, it's, it is true, though. We have some supply issues, and we certainly have record immigration. Okay. We will uh, take a quick commercial break, and uh, we'll come back. Lots more to uncover. Stay with us. Welcome back. Ron, I want to get your thoughts on um, Canada's banking watchdog. This is uh, OSPI. It looks like they're they're looking to beef up stress tests. How do you feel about it? Uh, specifically, they're looking to increase the scrutiny of the relationship between people's income and their total lending. They're going to look more closely at just how much um, car loans, car leases, student loans... They're, they want to see, they want to develop more of a relationship to total lending versus the income people have. We've always had that in our business. There's always been debt ratio servicing that needs to be hit, mm -hmm. but they are looking at making it a little bit tighter and, and really for people uh, to not exceed a specific percentage uh, in relationship to their income. Okay. Is there a way to circumvent it? To supplement it? To, to circumvent it. Oh, circumvent it. I'm For sorry. For those who are really, uh, they really uh, want a home, um, yeah, you, know, you kind of yeah. hear things about that. So, Well, we, we saw, uh, last year we saw the CBC Marketplace documentary about mortgage document fraud in Canada. These are uh, situations where fake income verification documents, uh, and even as far as fake uh, phone call responses to people looking to, to banks looking to confirm uh, income verification. Uh, I mean, it's a fairly sophisticated uh, program in some communities and some areas. It is pretty regional, like you, certainly nobody in Manitoba knows what we're talking about. But the reality is that it is there. It's not massive, but it by its own nature, it shouldn't exist at all. Yeah. There should be better, more sophisticated ways to make sure income is correct and it, it shouldn't be tolerated in the system. But it, this, these coming changes that we might see by uh, September, October put into place, if they further restrict people's ability to borrow money to buy houses, uh, get more just to buy houses, we may see a slight uptick in it. Uh, I'm hopeful we can, we can find a way around that. Okay. So for those um, who are in mortgages now that might be coming up for renewal, um, or those who are looking at mortgages, what advice do you have? Should they should they go variable or fixed, and, and for how long? Well, we have been you know very adamant that it makes no sense to take a variable mortgage at this point. Uh, right now, variable mortgages are more expensive, higher rates than short term fixed rate mortgages. Therefore, it makes no sense for the consumer to take on a variable rate mortgage with the hope that it's going to come down. You shouldn't pay a premium for hope. You know, yeah. that, that should never happen. So we're recommending short-term fixed-rate mortgages, uh, one, two, or three-year terms. Okay. Um, Ron, we really have a, a affordability issue in, in Canada, right? And I guess from where I sit, it doesn't seem like there's a real effort by our politicians 
to fix this. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to know your views and whether we will ever see reasonable home prices. It's a great question, uh, and it's you know potentially the great dilemma of our time. You have a group of people who bought houses in the last 20 years that have seen massive appreciation, great increases in equity. They feel their own wealth effect yeah. through their ho house becoming much more valuable. And those people are very much disinterested in seeing the price of houses go down. Similarly, we have young people, we have a new generation coming up, and we have new immigrants to Canada are saying to themselves, wow, these are some of the most expensive houses in the world in British Columbia and Ontario. What's going on here? I mean, this is really going to stifle my ability to own a home. So those are two solitudes that really trouble politicians. And so far, their solutions have been all lousy. You know, they, they talk about with great flourishes, the prime minister, the finance minister, the housing minister announces an extra 274 units mm -hmm. in a given community. <laughs> like what in the world is 274 yeah. units going to do when there's half a million people coming into Canada this year? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's a big it's a big issue and it's going to continue. Um, really appreciate your time today, Ron. Thanks, thanks. for coming on. My pleasure. Thanks well, for having me. i have to have you back. Ron Butler, mortgage broker. Well, that wraps up this episode. How are you feeling about home prices? Are you looking to get in? Are you worried about where home prices are going? And are you looking for a mortgage and want to learn more? Drop us an email. We can answer your questions. I'd love to hear from you. Until then, stay well, stay wise, and stay wealthy.